One feature that many modern smartphones have is an IR blaster, which allows you to use the phone as though it's a rem universal remote control. However, my phone, which is a OnePlus 2, along with most other sort of smartphones, don't have the hardware for this installed, so you can't actually do it. So in this video, I plan on making my own, using just a few sort of simple components. So in order to make this possible, we obviously need an app on the phone. So for this, I'm using one called IR Plus Wave. This is a simple universal remote control app. You can see it's, well, you just have different remote controls programmed into it, and you can just control it like that. Now, how does it work? Well, you'll notice that when I'm pressing these buttons, the phone makes a noise. That's because this app modulates the, radio, modulates the remote, remote control signal into an audio signal. So what you, do, you can do is you can build an IR blaster that connects to the 3.5mm jack on the phone, and it, the audio signal will then be used to control some LEDs. You can also buy these um, IR blasters pre-made that you can just plug in, but I thought I might as well build my own for a bit of fun. So that's the app there, so let's take a look at how we're going to build this. So, very simple components. So all I have is just a little box to build it in. You probably could do it a lot smaller than this, but I'm going to make it in quite a large box, just first of all to make it easy to work on and make it easy to show on camera. And also, if I make a really small thing, I'll lose it. This is probably a bit harder to lose. So, a little box to build it in. 3.5mm stereo jack. So you, it needs to be a stereo jack, and yeah, that's it there, so we'll use that. And then finally, a couple of LEDs. So these are infrared LEDs, so these will be suitable to transmit the signal. So on the IR Plus wiki, they provide a huge amount of information about this. So they, show, they talk about all different remote control codes, how to build it, how all the systems work, and they have this circuit diagram that shows how to build the IR blaster. So this is what I'm going to be following. Now you'll notice in this diagram that the left and right audio channels are connected to the LEDs, and the ground isn't connected at all. That's because what they do, in order to get the higher voltage for the LEDs to work, rather than just having the, this, the voltage be the difference between a signal and ground, they instead have the left and right channels inverted from each other. So what you'll actually get is sort of double the voltage, just the way they're sort of doing it, which is quite a clever way of, you know, getting that extra voltage out to light the LEDs. So all I should really need to do is connect the LEDs in sort of inverted polarity from each other across the left and right audio channels on the 3.5mm jack. But just to make it all neat, I'm going to build it inside the little box. So now let's look at how I'm going to put this together. So we have the little box here, and it just top comes off, just a couple of screws to mount that if I want it. And then what I'm going to do is mount, so the 3.5mm jack sticks out the bottom, and then have the two LEDs on the top here. So all I need to do now is drill a few holes to mount this connector and the two LEDs. So the LEDs are 5mm, so a 5mm hole will work. This is slightly bigger, so I'm going to have to sort of play about with different sizes to work out what it is. So yeah, just need to make these holes, and then I'll come back and actually start building it. Okay, so I've now finished drilling the holes, so I've put two 5mm holes on the top for the LEDs, and the LEDs fit into them really well, they sort of fit but they don't push all the way through, so that's exactly what I needed. Then on the bottom, we have another hole which I've mounted the 3.5mm jack in. I've then managed to get this stuck, so that's just going to stay in there for the duration. So if you look at the circuit diagram, you can see that the two LEDs are effectively connected to each other. The positive of one LED is connected to the negative of the other, and vice versa. So what I'm going to do is mount the two LEDs in the case, and then just solder the leads directly to each other, like from one LED to the other. So then they're then linked together, and then I'll just put a wire from the left and right audio channels across to each leg on the LEDs. So that should be quite a simple way to build it all. Then I'll just hot glue it all to sort of hold it all in the case. So now let's mount the LEDs and solder them together. Okay, so I've now mounted the two LEDs and then bent over the two bottom legs. So on the leftmost LED, the bottom leg is the cathode, and on the rightmost LED, the bottom leg is the anode. So as is done in the circuit diagram, we're going to connect these two together like this. So we'll do the bottom ones, cut off the excess, and then bend over the top ones and do the same. So all I need to do now is solder these two legs together. So hopefully that's relatively easy, and that'll work. There we go. So there we go. That's the bottom two legs connected together, so the anode of one LED is connected to the cathode of the other one. So all I need to do is do the same for the top ones. Okay, so I've finished neatening that up, so now the two legs on each LED are connected to the other LED. 
and we can use the multimeter to check this. So if we put the positive on one on the bottom and the other one on top, you can see it's working. We've got continuity through there. And likewise, if we swap the polarity around, we've also got continuity. So that's working. So no matter what the polarity is on the audio, on the signal coming in, one of the LEDs will light. So all I now need to do is put a wire from the left and right audio terminals on the jack directly across. So one of them will connect to the top, one of those will connect to the bottom. So just need to wire that up, then we should be done. So there we go, it's now complete. So all I've done now is just put a couple of wires across from the jack to the LEDs and then hot glued it all in. The glue isn't the neatest thing in the world, but I wanted to use a lot of it to make sure it's secure because when you're pulling it in and out the phone, it's going to pull on the jack and also just if it's being stored or carried about, those LEDs could get pushed in. So I've used a lot of glue just to ensure it's secure and all that's now really quite strong, so that's good. So all we now need to do is screw the top back on and then test it out. So the case came with a little top, which is quite nice, and a couple of screws, which I now dropped and we can just screw the top on. So there we have it, that's now the finished product. So on the top we have the two LEDs, on the bottom we have the 3.5mm jack, and that all plugs very neatly into my phone, like that. So now let's test it out and see if it actually works. Okay, so now let's give it a go with this TV. So I've added the Sony TV remote to the app, so all I need to do now is plug the blaster in, and we'll try and control the TV. So you do need to get really close up to the sensor, it's not a very long distance signal. But as you can see there, TV's now switched on. Obviously the other buttons work as well. So for example, we can go into the menu. We can navigate through that. All these sort of menu entries work. You can also obviously go back out the menu and you can turn it all off again. So yeah, it actually does work. So there you have it, it actually works. Now, it isn't the sort of thing you would use as a you know, permanent remote control because you do have to hold it really close to the sensor, effectively like right up to it. And you do have to get the angle right. I think part of that's down to, down to my choice of LEDs. I think these LEDs are quite high, like require quite a high voltage to work and they've got quite a narrow beam which causes the issue with angles. But it's quite a cool device to have as almost just like a tool because it doesn't just control things like TVs. So I've tested it with my Sony TV as well as my Samsung TV. Both of those work fine. But the, you could also use one of these sort of universal remotes for these. However, what you can't use these for is things that aren't really standard AV equipment. For example, this has codes for things like air conditioners. So this could be really handy if you've got something like an air conditioner and you need to control it but you've lost the remote and you just want to quickly use it on like a one-off basis. So it's quite handy for that sort of thing. Also things like projectors and AV receivers where they may have functions that you can't actually control using a button on the, on the device and you need the remote control to get into the menu system. And if you just need to change one setting and the remote's gone missing, you probably don't want to have to go and buy a remote control for that. So you could possibly just use this just on a one-off basis just to control that. And yeah, it's pretty neat. So, yep, yeah, it's, it's not amazing as a permanent remote, but for a sort of one-off basis, it actually works quite nicely. And I suppose you could also adapt this idea knowing that you can use like an audio interface to control LEDs like this, and potentially you could build a more advanced one that's got some sort of amplification and actual, you know, active circuitry in it and, you know, make something that's a bit more powerful. So yeah, it actually works quite well. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching.